Good evening. I'd like to welcome all of you and Steve Keen to this first talk in our series for 2019 of Economics Beyond the Swabian Hausfrau. I'm going to keep this very short, we always do. If you want to know more about Steve, you'll find it in the internet. And I'll just get started then. The lodestar for this series of talks is a quote from Ha Jun Cheng. You may not know him. He's a very uh, brilliant economist at Cambridge University who recently said, we need an economic literacy campaign so people understand the language used by the ruling class. And this is the motto of these talks is a sort of literacy campaign that you start ending, uh, we try to help you to understand more about economics because something has to counter the rapidly increasing inequality which is happening in Europe as well as the constant attack upon democracy through neoliberal forces within the EU. We are not going to try to convince you of any sort of ideology or we are not associated to any party even though we are in this house. Uh, what we want to do is empower you to challenge the dominant neoliberal discourse and what we're going to do is try to give you some tools to work with. What you build with the tools, that's up to you. But we, the important thing is to provide you with information that you're not otherwise finding in state or corporate media. If you, I don't know if you've seen this, it's lying about. It's a flyer, all six talks in this first half year are in here. We have three with simultaneous translations. Three are only in English. Uh, all of them are excellent. In fact, I think we can safely say these are all world-class uh, academics, economists, and we have one historian as well. Uh, it is really worth taking the time, and many of you have done this tonight, to come and uh, share this with us. The last thing I want to talk about is I've been asked actually to address an issue, the fact that of the six talks, there's only one woman. And there's a supply and a demand side to this question. The supply side is are very few, too few women economists. And this has resulted in not only that there are not many, but those that there are are very much in demand. It's difficult to get any. You know, they're, they're booked out for quite a while. Anyway, just um, for the next, for the second half, for the three, the three talks with simultaneous uh, translations, we do have two of them. Of the three, are women. The one we're very proud of both. We're going to have Grace Blakely, who you, many of you may know, maybe not and also Daniela Gabor, so expect them in the next half year. Then there's the demand side, and this seems to be a problem. I don't think it's only in Germany, but uh, football trainers and economists are supposed to be men, and <laughs> this is something we fight with. We had a talk by Anne Pettifor here not long ago, and it was shortly after she had already been announced as the winner of the Hannah Arendt Prize, and to put it mildly, it was not sold out. Uh, that means uh, it's not only, uh, it's good that people say we want more women, but that means you also have to come when we do <laughs> bring them. <laughs> Which brings me to the topic that we have Francis Coppola in two weeks, on the 13th of February, not here, but in the Copenhagener Straße 9, Unfortunately, it's a smaller room because everyone assumes if it's a woman, no one's coming. I hope that we can uh, change that on the 13th, this view of women economists not being uh, interesting because they are bloody interesting, especially Francis, but the, other, the others too. So we're very pleased if you would come on the 13th. To conclude, I'd like to thank, you know, this is organized by a lot of people 
not only by us from Brave New Europe, but by Helle Panke, the Netzwerk für Plurale Ökonomik, those are students, and the Rosen Luxemburg Stiftung, and the media partner is Oxy. I'd like to thank them all for making this possible. And then very briefly, as I said, I'm from Brave New Europe. There's a sheet of paper in German and English, what we do. A lot of what's discussed in these talks, you can find there. In fact, if you're not sure about some of the things Steve has said tonight, we have an article from him with some of the material which he's going to present tonight so you can read it. It's unfortunately all in English, no German, but uh, do have a look. And then the last thing I'll remind you at the conclusion is Brave New Europe has no state funding. We, uh, we live from donations and we live very, very meagerly from a few donations that we have. What we'd like to do is if anyone gets around to it, you can go onto our website. Is a monthly donation would help us greatly. Otherwise, we will, when you go out, we will have two of these tins where uh, you can make a donation now without warning, uh, without waiting. <laughs> Good, that's it then. And I'll just turn you over to Steve and see you later. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> Actually, partly to see the audience and partly to see my slides, I might stand up and turn around as I push the uh, presentation forward because my computer is over there and I... I can't read my own notes through the back of my own head, so I'll need to turn occasionally. So I, I very much like the idea, by the way, of framing this about the, 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 Swa the Swabian uh, Hausfrau, Hausfrau, pardon my German pronunciations, will be dreadful. Um, but I, I like that concept because it really does uh, encapsulate what makes it difficult for non-Orthodox economists to be heard because this seems so obvious. Everybody thinks it must be correct. So let's start with the person who gave us the, uh, the vision of the Swabian housewife telling us how we should manage national and international economies. Of course, it's Angela. Man hätte hier in Stuttgart, in Baden-Württemberg, einfach nur eine schwäbische Hausfrau fragen sollen. Man kann nicht auf Dauer über seine Verhältnisse leben. So that's the perspective, and it goes from the top down. And it's something which our own experience makes us also project from the bottom up as well. And we'll talk about that towards the end. Why do we fall for it? So it is a worthy objective to try to build up a buffer of money. That's what the Swabian Hausfrau is about. That's what we individually are all trying to do, to have that buffer in case things go wrong. And when that buffer gets very low, we obviously panic. We think we should be saving money. So it's very sensible to see that as a private virtue. But what I want to show you with is what happens when you practice that private virtue at the level of a national or international economy. So I'm going to give you a thought experiment here. And I want you to imagine that in the... I'm going to use imaginary numbers here, but I, if I use proper numbers, I'd get exactly the same result. It's just to make the arithmetic easier for you. So imagine the whole, is it called a state of Swabia? A state or a province? Huh? Federal, state. Fe federal, yeah, I'll call it a state to make it easy on myself, okay? So imagine the whole state of Swabia starts in year zero with spending two billion euros per year on the rest of Germany. So if you, if you counted all the money coming out of Swabia and going to people in Germany, that'd be two billion euros per year, and the same for going out of Swabia to the rest of the European Union. And then income coming into Swabia from those external regions of the same amounts, two billion euros in each case. And then Swabia collectively decides to save 100 million euro per year. So it, how does it do that? It spends less on Germany and less on the Euro, the European uh, Union, while they continue spending the same amount. So if you look at the, the arithmetic, in year one, you're spending 2,000, uh, you're getting 2,000 of income, so you're saving a zero. In year one, your spending is 1,900, your income is still 2,000, so you save 100, billion, 100 million euro that year. 
and that's mission accomplished. That's what you're trying to do. What happens to the rest of Germany and the rest of the European Union if you do that? What you've, to see that, I have to add an extra column for each of them in this table. And I'm going to pretend uh, that they also start from exactly the same numbers, just to make it easy to work out the arithmetic. So what I draw up is a table that looks like this. And what I'm showing uh, on each of these points, if I can I hope the, the mouse is upside down, so I really can't point properly, unfortunately. But if you see the first row, the minus 2,000 there is money going out of Swabian bank accounts. And the plus 1,000, the rest of Germany is one of the destinations. Plus 1,000, the rest of the EU, that's the other destination. Obviously, each row must sum to zero. Otherwise, I'm making an arithmetical mistake. Okay. Now, you look at the same thing for the rest of Germany. Of course, it's minus 2,000 in the middle there because I've got the, third, the second column. 1,000 on Swabia, 1,000 on the rest of the EU. And then the rest of the EU, 1,000 on Swabia, 1,000 on the rest. Now, notice not only do the, the rows sum to zero, as they must do, but the columns also sum to zero. So there's no savings occurring at all anywhere in this first example. Then Swabia in year one changes what it's doing and spends less. So therefore, it's spending 1900, so the rest of Germany gets 950 from Swabia and the rest of the EU gets 950 as well. That row still sums to zero, so it's still mathematically correct. And I've shown you the sum beforehand in the first column, that Swabia saving 100. But look what's happened to the rest now. Germany's, the rest of Germany's income from Swabia has fallen by 50, billion, 50 million. Uh, it's still earning 1,000 million from the rest of the EU. Its total spending is still 2,000. It's now this saving by 50 million. And exactly the same thing applies to the rest of the EU. So a decision by Swabia to save money if nothing else changes in response to that, if the other parts of the world continue spending at the same rate, they dissave. Not their decision. Okay. The decision by Swabia to save forces the other two to dissave by precisely as much. And that's not a that's not a quirk. That's a necessary outcome of looking at this at the level of a nation or a group of nations or even the entire globe. Aggregate savings is zero. And this is one reason, as a, speaking as a person who's a professional economist, I would like to ban the word saving at the national level because it's been so misleading. We extrapolate what we can do at the individual level to the collective where it doesn't make any sense at all. But unless we see it from the collective point of view, we can't understand that. Now, what then happens if in response to that, of course, you know, the, the rest of Germany and the rest of the EU did not decide to, to dissave 50 million. It's a product of what Swabia decided to do. So let's say they to make the same decision. Let's spend less ourselves. And now I've got each of them spending rather than 1,000 million on each, each other of the other two groups, spending 950, just like Swabia is doing. What has actually happened? Well... Swabia's spending is now 950 on each of the rest of Germany and the rest of the EU. Its income from them is 10... Is, actually, I've got my numbers wrong there, I just noticed. <laughs> Pardon me, I've got to correct that. That should be something to 1900 each way. I've got an error in the... I didn't change the 50, so my mistake on the arithmetic. Uh, I normally use a mathematical program to make sure I don't make mistakes. This is done too quickly, just using Word. But what I'm showing is the income has fallen by 300 million. So the total savings objective by the three groups was to save 100 million euro each. What they actually ended up doing is reducing G GDP income by precisely their savings target. So the attempt to save money didn't save money at all and actually reduce income and expenditure. And this is the trick that people don't realise when they say we should all save because we can't all save. The sum of all savings is zero because at the aggregate level, your expenditure is somebody else's income. Okay? Now, your expenditure and your income can be different. 
But if you add up everybody's expenditure and everybody's income, they've got to be the same. And that's the point about the rows. Now, I've got, I made a mathematical mistake myself there. I've got to fix that up. But an arithmetical mistake. When you do it properly, the rows must sum to zero. Okay? So the sum of all savings is zero. And therefore, when people try to save money, individuals can do it. Collectively, what they do is reduce income. Now, that's the opposite of what you're trying to do in some ways. Okay? You're trying to keep your income high while saving money. What you actually do by saving money is reduce income. I'm a bit embarrassed I'm going to have an arithmetical mistake photographed and shown up on YouTube, but that's life. <laughs> happens when you're doing things too quickly. So what's actually happened? Well, before the decision to save, total expenditure was $6 billion and total income was $6 billion. With the decision to save money, that's the original situation. I think I made, I've copied the same mistake, uh, but I want to show the, the logic here. That's expenditure. You can measure income, GDP, gross domestic product, in two ways. You can add up, actually there are three, but I'm showing you two here. You can measure by what people spend, well, you can measure what people earn. And when you look at the statistics, there'll always be some errors because I don't know why, but some people hide what they spend and hide what they earn. Don't tell the authorities. <laughs> Strange behaviour. Uh, but if you actually do it technically, you get exactly the same numbers both ways. And you must, otherwise you've made a mistake, which I've done on that previous table. Uh, but that's the initial situation. So there's your expenditure. You get three times 2,000, you get 6,000 billion of expenditure. That's the expenditure measure. You add up the income, you get exactly the same number. Now when you go to the next situation, when you try to save, again I've still got that same error there, so I've got to fix that up later. I haven't changed the 1,000 over there, that was a typing error. But what you get is a 300 billion fall in income and a 300 billion fall in expenditure because at the aggregate level they are the same thing. So that's, if, if you get that insight and nothing else out of my talk tonight, I think you've got the, germ, the gems of understanding, the germ of understanding why the vision that we should run a country like a household doesn't work. Why it leads to serious errors in how you manage a national economy. So the intuition is that as individuals our expenditure and our income can differ. But at the collective level, when we add up everything together, expenditure is income. Expenditure actually causes income. Now again, I've got, I'm talking about causation as a direction because conventional economic theory has this view, they, they deny they have it but they really still do, called Say's Law. Have you ever heard of Say's Law? And that is supply creates its own demand. Well in fact, the truth is demand creates its own supply. Rather than income determining expenditure, expenditure determines income. That's the causal sequence. What you decide to spend becomes somebody else's income. Uh, so in that case, savings is zero. If you add up all the savings in the world, you get zero. It's a concept, what's called a conservation rule. And it's a general principle. If I replaced, I had Swabia, the rest of Germany, the rest of the EU and those slides. But if I change that to being, say, firms and households and banks, which is another way to divide up the world, I'll get the same answer. And if I have non-bank and non-government, so everybody who's not, a, basically all households and all firms, if I have that and banks and government, I get the same result. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean money can't be created, by the way. I, I might confuse people showing that. Money creation still occurs here, but even with money creation happening, you'll still get this result in terms of savings. So, with that problem, you have a set of questions that make a lot more sense. Let's take the Swabian point of view and move on and say, if a Swabian house for our wants to save, then who's going to be forced to dissave? And can they afford to do it? That's your first question. Your second is, why do they want to save? Now, obviously, we each know ourselves why we want to save money. We've all, I think most of us, been in some situation where we're really tight with money and we wish we had more in our savings account. Okay? So, but I want to elaborate on why capitalism and a monetary system in particular 
makes that challenging and, and necessary. And finally, if it's legitimate to want to save, then how do we accommodate that? How do we let it happen without having the aggregate effect I've shown you a moment ago? I'm going to take the second question first. Why do they want to save in the first place? And the real reason, and this applies to all of us as well, we want to have positive equity. We want to have what we are, what we are owed by other people, what are our assets, we want it to be greater than our liabilities, what we owe to other people. And there's a fundamental rule of accounting. And by the way, accounting is not something I learned at university. I could have done accounting. You've seen the joke about the economist as somebody who lacks the personality and savoir faire to be an accountant. Okay. Um, but I decided not to do accounting and, uh, and I, I learnt this actually largely by building the software package called Minsky that I'll be showing you later. In putting that together I really learnt the importance of understanding accounting for understanding a monetary economy. But the basic rule of accounting is that assets minus liabilities equals equity. So if you t add up the monetary value of all your assets and subtract the monetary value of all your liabilities, what you have is your net worth, which is called equity, sometimes called capital. Now, savings gives the Sabian house, house, Hausfrau positive net worth. And the idea is to have a buffer in your, to have a buffer in case your income doesn't maintain itself, or you get an unexpected expense. The, the classic story, I'm sure every language has this saving for a rainy day. And it's a legitimate motivation. There's nothing wrong with having that motivation. But what's the problem? Well, one thing about that all economists to some extent understand, not a, the mainstream not enough, but everybody understands this one, your assets are somebody else's liability and vice versa. So if you do your sums, if assets minus liabilities is greater than zeros, you've got positive net worth. Compared to you, the rest of the world has, a, has, a, has to have identical negative net worth. Okay? The sum works both ways. So if you increase your financial equity, somebody else's has to fall by precisely as much. Okay? The total amount of money can change, go up or down, but that rule applies. So why don't we see it? Why don't we realise this? Well, largely because we still think about the economy in physical terms. We're using money, which is a claim on other people. Okay? Money is not uh, an object. It is not a commodity. But we still tend to think about it that way, and conventional economics leads us that, to make that mistake as well. So we can all accumulate physical things. For example, we can all save more cars or watches or jewellery. Okay? You having a watch doesn't mean somebody else has to lose a watch, depending on the suburb you're in. Okay? <laughs> Okay. Uh, when we apply it to money, it doesn't apply at all. It's quite different. To have more, somebody else has to have less. Okay. That's in terms of the expenditure minus income. The amount of money can change. I want to make sure that's obvious. But imagine money was gold. Now, most people think, to some extent, they think money is gold, or gold is money. There are gold bugs. I deal with them all the time uh, in my internet life. And they think money should be gold or gold is money, et cetera, et cetera. Well, if that's the case, then all of these characters can go out and accumulate more of it at once. Okay? If one finds gold, it doesn't mean the other person has to lose gold. Again, it depends on the place you're mining. Uh, but that's, that's the vision we all have. And the gold stocks can all rise at once. Everybody who's digging up gold can add to their gold stocks at the same time. That's not so good for the planet, of course. It tends to have lots of holes dug in it. So as the gold stocks of the humans goes up, the gold stocks of the planets must go down by exactly as much in terms of what's in the earth versus what's in vaults. And we leave a lot of garbage around when we do it as well. Okay. So I've got reasons for being critical about the idea that gold should be money even from an ecological point of view. But we then apply that same thinking about gold or a commodity to money. And that's what leads us astray. Now, we can't all accumulate more money at once. Okay? Money, money, I'm being a bit um, colloquial here. We can accumulate more money all at once, but we accumulate debt at the same time. So there's no change in what's called our net financial assets. Now, 
we think about money being like being a commodity like gold. And I built this software package I call Minsky, after Hyman Minsky, to be able to analyze a monetary economy properly. Uh, and I use double entry bookkeeping tables because I realized, anybody here is an accountant, by the way? Any accountants in the audience? My God, they are boring, aren't they? Um, accountants invented the idea of double entry bookkeeping as what I would call the world's first graphical user interface. Okay? It was a visual way of being able to understand what's happening in an economy. And over time, I've extended Minsky to the stage where it includes double entry bookkeeping as an essential part of the logic. So what I'm showing here is I'm imagining that each of the, each of Swabia, the rest of Germany, the rest of EU has a thousand euro, a thousand million euro in bank accounts and that turns over twice a year. That's where the spending comes from. So we've got Swabia spending on Germany, so money comes out of the Swabian bank accounts and goes into the German ones. Money, Swabia spending on the EU, so money out of Swabian accounts and into the EU. And then there's money coming back the opposite way as well. All these spending is shown there. So that's showing it in my program Minsky. And what I can do in Minsky, and I, I can't run this now because I, um, I might try a risk and see if it works, but I'm, I'm worried I'll stuff up the presentation. So I might come back to this, maybe stand over there if anybody wants me to show you how this software works later on. But what this does is I have a, as you can see, a bank icon there. The bank includes the double entry bookkeeping. I have controls. Let's see if I can... I've got to go reverse direction. Uh, did you get it? Not going to do it. Uh, I can change the amount of money being spent per year and see what happens. And as each group decides to save money, they save, the others just save, which is shown on the bottom left-hand corner chart there, and GDP falls by the amount they're trying to save. Okay? It's simple mathematical logic when you look at it properly. Okay? Saving at the individual level causes a fall in income at the aggregate level. Now, when I do that, I've done this here with a few times. So I started back in that previous slide with each group spending a thousand euro per year on the other groups. So total expenditure with three groups was six thousand euro per year. And they variously, first of all the Swabians try to save, then the Germans, then the rest of the European Union. You can see changes in the bank accounts. Aggregate savings remains at zero. GDP falls. What's actually happening is money is turning over less frequently. In that sense, money is less productive. What you do when you try to save money is slow down how fast money circulates. What that means is total demand falls. That's what Keynes called the paradox of thrift. But Keynes didn't have a tool like Minsky to illustrate what's going on. So people didn't really understand it and conventional economists pretend that the economy is like a barter system. They teach students not to study money. Money does not occur in their mathematical models of the macroeconomy. So they don't actually understand this themselves. So the best thing at the aggregate level is actually to try to spend more money. What you do then is you generate more GDP for every dollar because every dollar turns over more frequently. So what I'm doing here is showing a decision to spend more by each of those groups. That makes a few changes to the bank accounts as well. Aggregate staving still remains at zero, but GDP rises because the velocity of money rises. But there's a catch. One, I'm coming to the question of why do you want to save? What's the motivation? And there's a real catch in capitalism, which I don't think fans of capitalism like Austrian economists or critics like Marxian economists actually understand, and that is that since assets minus liabilities is equal to equity, and since your assets are somebody else's liabilities, then the sum of all equity is zero, financial equity. Okay? The same rule applies to banks. Banks are part of the overall economy. But a bank, to operate a bank, you must have positive equity. The assets of a bank must be greater than their liabilities, otherwise they're bankrupt. So the first act of forming a bank, and I have friends who have built, established banks, 
First thing I had to do was raise a large amount of cash from the public or their friends to have positive equity. Then they could register as a bank after passing a range of other tests, legal tests. So they start with positive equity. Therefore, the banking sector has to have positive equity. Therefore, the rest of the economy has to have negative equity if banks are the only source of money. So by definition, because they have to have positive equity, the rest of us, non-banks, have to have negative. Okay. And that motivates the desire by us to save money because we're actually, we don't realise it, but in the aggregate, we're starting out with negative equity. Okay. So we're trying to achieve positive when it's impossible because if we achieve positive, the banks go bankrupt. Okay? So it's a real catch. It's the, one of the great catch-22s of capitalism. So you divide world into non-banks and banks. Banks have to have positive equity. The aggregate, therefore, the, everybody, including the Swabians, has to be negative. So, boy, you're motivated to save, aren't you? And that means you spend more slowly and the economy slows down, which is not your objective at all. It's the opposite objective you're trying to achieve. And this is one of the ways in which capitalism is full of paradoxes, which we have to understand to be able to manage it properly. So we have a, a motivation to save which simply slows down how fast money circulates without creating more money. And that makes us very interested when anybody comes along and says, I've got a great way of making money. Yeah, tell me more. Okay? We fall for Ponzi schemes because when you buy an asset something created by a, a Ponzi schema, whether that's housing or shares or the original Charles Ponzi. When they do that, we value those assets by multiplying the price the asset sells for, the last sale price, times the entire stock of assets. And we say that's the value of all the housing in Germany, all the, all the housing in the UK, all the shares in the stock market and so on. Now, that's a fictional calculation because if we all tried to sell our houses all at once, what price would you get? Pretty much zero, okay? It's a false calculation because only a tiny fraction of the stock of houses sells every year, a tiny fraction of the shares and so on. And yet the valuation we put on them when we do these tables is the last price, the, whatever the asset is sold for, multiplied by the entire stock of the assets that are available. But that fools us into believing we have positive equity out of that. That's the danger trap that I think America fell for with the subprime crisis. So it looks like if assets are rising greater than your liabilities. It looks like we all have positive equity. In fact, we've borrowed money from a bank, driven up the price of the assets, and got ourselves locked into a financial crisis. That's what tends to happen. So we. We try to escape from negative equity by borrowing money from banks and then buying assets which actually drives up their prices. And when we do that, we have a bubble and ultimately a financial crisis. So that's, that's, that's the problem of believing we can do this. So doing it by Ponzi schemes is not a good idea. And that's one thing I will take my hat off to Germany for not doing, at least in recent history unlike America, unlike the UK, unlike my home country of Australia. But is there a way to accommodate this? Is there a way we can make it possible for everybody, except somebody, to have positive equity? Because in total, it must be zero. So you need to find some entity that can permanently dis-save. And what I want to show you first off is I could go through the exercise with banks, but it gets a bit complicated. Um, Basically, the problem with banks or try, trying to get positive equity by using banks is banks, when they give you money, give you an identical amount of debt. Okay? You don't go to a bank, ask for a loan, and they say, here's a thousand euro, go and enjoy yourself. They say, here's a thousand euro, you owe us a thousand euro. So there's zero change in your net equity out of borrowing from a bank. What you do is you drive up asset prices with that money, and that's what makes you think you've got positive equity. So banks don't work. What about the government? Well. There I've got taxation. The, government, the Swabi is spending a thousand on, on Germany, the rest of Germany, spending a thousand on the European Union and paying 200 in tax. Uh, and then in the opposite direction, I've got the government spending 300 
So expending exceeds taxation. Now that is a no-no, I know, that is a no-no in Germany. That's, that's the whole purpose of the European Union, is to stop that happening, to get governments to run surpluses. But the reason it works for individuals is that when you get money from the government, it doesn't come with a debt for you. The government may have to run up a debt. I'll talk about that in a moment. But when you get money from the government, whether they're paying you a welfare check or they're paying you a salary or you're a contractor who sold something to the government, the money they give you doesn't come with the debt attached. It's an extra asset for you without being a liability for you. So what that means is, when you look at this, I can have, in this case for Swabia, expenditure of 2,200 income, including the income from the government, of 2,300. Swabia saves 100 million per year. The same for the rest of Germany, the same for the EU. So government money actually creates net financial assets for the rest of the economy. That's an essential insight. It increases private sector money without increasing private sector debt. It increases government debt. It has to match. Government debt has to go up by precisely that amount. But we can all save money if the government spends more than it takes back in taxation. And that therefore means we can have positive net equity and we don't get so worried about being negative equity, which otherwise is inevitable. It's the government that has to worry about the negative equity. So, can the government do it? Can the government afford to permanently dissave? Well, technically it can, because the one thing which distinguishes the government from any other institution in its country, and I'm not talking European Union now, unfortunately, is the government in a country owns its own central bank. Now, imagine if you're spending could be financed by your own liabilities. You write a, 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 a IOU to somebody, only it's not IOU, it says, here's money, you go and use it, give me whatever I want to buy with it, and people accepted it. Would you ever run a, worry about running out of money? If you had a printing press in your basement that legally printed legally accepted notes, okay, you, don't have, you would not have a constraint. The, there's, there's a wonderful um, Hungarian economist who's very not anywhere near as well known as he should be, called Janos Kornai. And he talks about this being what he called a soft budget constraint. The rest of us have a hard budget constraint. We can't create money. We can't spend money we create, otherwise we go to jail because it's counterfeiting. But the government can create money, spend money that it creates. And that's a unique power in any economy. So if you look at what's actually going on technically, the Treasury, when the government does a budget that says it's going to run a deficit. The Treasury calculates the difference between what they plan to spend and what they expect to take back in taxation. They issue bonds. Once the government approves that budget, the central bank instantly recognises the government as having the money. Now imagine if you try to do the same thing, if you try to finance extra spending by issuing bonds and you create, you know, 10,000 euro worth of bonds, you couldn't spend until you sold the bonds. A bank wouldn't accept that you've issued the bonds, therefore they should regard you as having 10,000 extra euro in your bank account. But once the government passes a law saying, yes, that's our supply bill, then the, tre the central bank regards the government as having the money. They can do it straight away. Now the bonds are normally sold to the private financial sector. But then the central bank does what are called open market operations, OMO, OMO as it's abbreviated, all the time, buying and selling bonds off the financial sector. And if they're buying more than they take back, they're injecting money into the financial sector. So that creates the money, part of the money. And the central bank can also, unlike a private bank, a central bank can operate with negative equity. This was actually recently stated uh, by a working paper from the Bank of England. And I must say, by the way, uh, in the past, uh, be before the financial crisis, central banks were as much a 
inverted commas, enemy of the type of approach I take to economics as academic economists were, where what's called neoclassical economics dominates how they think. But since the financial crisis, central banks have come across to the way of thinking that my rebel group of economists have been pushing for 50 years, saying banks create money when they lend, the central bank is not constrained, the government is not constrained by a lack of money. It's constrained by lack of resources in its own economy, potentially, but not by a lack of money. So in this particular paper, the Central Bank of England says central banks can operate with zero or negative equity, not a possibility for a, a private bank. Uh, now, of course, they have to, that only applies to their own currency, but they can operate with negative equity. They don't face the limitation that a private bank does. So that gives them the capability to finance what the government wants to do. They don't have to think about, do we have enough equity left to finance this? Can we handle the gearing ratio, which a normal bank has to think about? So if the government decides to save, on the other hand, which is the objective that Schäuble and Merkel and the framers of the, of the Eurozone had for the governments of the Eurozone, if they save, the rest of the economy is necessarily dissaving. Now, can you all afford to dissave? You're already with negative equity, collectively. No, you can't. And in fact, it doesn't just, as a, when a private organisation, a private individual decides to save, they slow down how fast money turns over, but they don't destroy money. But when you repay a bank debt or when the government decides to save money, it does destroy it. When you look what money is, money is the cash we have in circulation plus the money in bank accounts. Okay. Now, if, you, if taxes exceed spending, then the government is taking more money out of your bank accounts than it's putting back in. So your bank accounts fall, which is destroying money. Okay. So the government saving is not a good idea. It's a very bad idea. But it's a bad idea that is at the heart of the European Union and the Eurozone. So this is one reason why when you look at the historical data, serious financial crises have frequently been preceded by the government deciding to save money. So this is a chart showing the surplus of the American government since 1900. It starts over here, 1900. There's the zero line, so for the whole of the pre-First World War period, the government was trying to run a balanced budget. They couldn't maintain a balanced budget during the First World War. Okay. Huge spending then. The deficit hit 18% of GDP. Then notice this bit here. That is the 1920s, the roaring 20s. Okay. The government was running a surplus. This is the American government of 1% of GDP for the whole decade. Now, if the idea of the government saving money is a good idea, then the 1930s must have been a fabulous decade. They weren't, were they? Nobody here believes that? Good. It was disastrous. Rather than saving a rainy day, it caused the cyclone of the Great Depression and then the Second World War. There's a 1% surplus. That's the government spending being boosted to about 6% of GDP during the Great Depression. That was the New Deal and so on. Under Clinton, a 2% of GDP surplus, the Great Recession, with a much larger, if you'll notice, level of government spending. If you look here, after running a 1% of GDP surpl surplus for uh, the whole of the 1920s, for a fair bit, of the Great Depression, they were running about a 5% of GDP deficit. But then we go forward to 2008, and from running a 2% surplus for a fairly short period, they ran up to a 10% of GDP deficit. Now, which one was worse? The Great Depression or the Great Recession? The Great Recession was worse, but was, was, was not as bad as the Great Depression, had a larger level of government spending. There is a causal link. 
the government spending stopped the private sector going as deeply into reducing its own debt level and causing a collapse in demand. And what actually happens when the government does something like running a surplus, because it therefore means you are going into deficit, it means you're really interested in anybody selling you a Ponzi scheme. And the 1920s, the Roaring Twenties, the Great Gatsby, was full of periods of people selling Ponzi schemes. And ditto for the subprime crisis in America and so on. So it's not the only factor. But if the government tries to run a surplus, it triggers the private sector to try to make up for the negative in its own balance sheets. And the private sector will fall for schemes like the subprime crisis, like shares during the 1920s and so on. So here's a very long-term view of the level of private debt and government debt. The red line is, go is private debt, the blue is, is government. And you can see that in the early days of the American um, democracy, difficult word to use for America, but I'll still use it, uh, it got its debt down to zero. Now, notice this huge plunge here in private debt. That was actually a crisis we've all forgotten about go and do a search and then you'll find it in Wikipedia, they call the Panic of 1837. Then you have this drop here, increase in government spending in the 19, 1920s. This one here, decline in private sector spending, increase in government sector spending, that was called the Civil War. There's a strong correlation again between these periods where the government decides to run a surplus when the private sector runs a deficit or writes off its debt, private debt as well, to try to bring itself into balance that way, it tends to lead to massive social conflict. Then the second, the Great Depression. Here's the government paying its debt down. There's the private sector doing the opposite. That's the borrowing for the bubble of the 1920s. This period is when the economy was falling so rapidly that even though people were paying their debt down then, the ratio of private debt to GDP rose because GDP was falling twice as fast as private debt was falling. Then we have, along this whole period, as the government's paying its debt off, the private sector's increasing its debt. Then we have the plunge of the Great Recession and the government spending goes up after the recession starts. So I want you to... Don't just listen to somebody with ideology about these things, whether it's left or right. Make sure they've got some empirical data behind them. I want to show you the, the role here. When we have a period of great growth in private debt followed by a crash in private debt, that's when we have the biggest crises in capitalism. So this is the same da data again for the level of private debt compared to GDP. But the blue line here now is the annual change in debt. Now that annual change in debt is equivalent to credit. When you borrow money from a bank, your debt rises. When you pay money off your debt, your debt falls. Ironically, the worst periods for capitalism are when debt is falling. Willing to discuss that a bit more in detail after, in the discussions afterwards. But for this period here, we have negative credit of about 10% of GDP. For the Great Depression, negative credit of about 10% of GDP. For the Great Recession, negative credit of about 6% of GDP. And if you look at the post-war period, there's 1945 roughly there, for the whole post-war period there's been positive credit. And because there's been positive credit, the level of debt has risen. And if you look at the level of debt that America is now in, even after a fall in debt after the crisis, it's still greater than it peaked during the Great Depression. So because we focus upon government debt and obsess about that and worry about that, ignore private debt, we've let the biggest private debt bubble in history occur without us realising it's happened. So there we have the Panic of 1837, the Great Depression and the Great Recession, all periods with substantial negative, equity, negative uh, credit. And if you take a look at how credit correlates to unemployment. This is looking again over the very long term, going back to 1890, which is as far back as I have unemployment records for America. I think you can see the negative correlation. When credit falls, unemployment rises. 
This is the real worry. This is the real thing we need to worry about. Not government debt, not change in government debt, but private debt and change in private debt. They're what drive the economy. Uh, because I've got this huge scale here, you can't see how clearly uh, the two work in opposing directions. But when unemployment goes down, credit's going up. Unemployment goes up, credit's going down. Okay. We have to tame the private financial sector and worry about that rather than worrying about the government sector. Now, what I've gone through, I think you can see I've got a fair bit of empirical data to support the case I'm making. And the logic is quite straightforward as well. So why is it not, well, okay, <laughs> a bit difficult. But it's, why is it not common knowledge? Well, if you look at what astronomy was like before Copernicus, everybody knew the Earth was the centre of the universe and everybody knew the sun orbited around because we wake up in the morning and see the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Obvious. Okay. Observation tells us that that must be true. Now, if you back in those days believed the Earth was the centre of the solar system, and the sun and the, so the sun was the centre rather, and the Earth orbited, you were a lunatic. Okay. You were a madman. You were a Copernicus. You got locked up. So the belief system was dominated by a false vision. And I think today's mainstream economics is very much like Ptolemy's astronomy. It looks superficially convincing. There's enough conventional feedback to make us believe it makes sense. But what Ptolemy's model was to say the Earth is almost the centre of the universe and the planets and the stars and the sun orbit around us on perfect spheres and to explain perfect circles, perfect spheres, and to explain why the planets reverse direction, they're on circles on circles. Now that was, did a very good job of fitting the data and it was completely wrong. Okay? So you can get an empirically accurate model which is totally wrong. That's one of the dangers. You've got to get your logic correct initially. So what do mainstream economists do? Well, they model the economy as if it's in equilibrium, when in reality it's far from equilibrium. But they got stuck on this idea of equilibrium as the essential feature of capitalism. Now, if you think about it, equilibrium is the last thing you'd characterise as a feature of capitalism. In fact, its strength is how it responds to disequilibrium, innovation and change. I've actually um, having a bit of fun looking at uh, the mobile phones of one of the organisers here. It's such an antique, it's all of 10 years old. Okay? I had a friend once buy a brand new Russian motorbike. It was designed, it was the same design in 1972 as BMW had in 1942. They didn't innovate. Capitalism innovates and changes, that's one of its strengths. They treat the economy as if it runs on barter. They ignore the monetary system. That's why this stuff is not common knowledge. If they really thought about it, we'd have a monetary approach to economics. They stick with the barter approach. And they try to build the macro by extrapolating from the micro. They try to do exactly what the Swabian housewife analogy does. Say, this is what an individual does, therefore that's what the group should do. Now, this is a, what's called a fallacy of composition by Keynes. But I want to give you a very simple example of that. Because that were true, that you had to, they, they believe you have to work out the aggregate by extrapolating from the individual. Now, if you have a glass of water in your hand, water consists of billions and billions and billions of identical molecules of H2O. If the same idea applied to water, you could be able to work out the characteristics of water by extrapolating from a single molecule. So there would need to be water molecules of H2O, ice molecules of H2O, and my absolute favourite, snowflake molecules of H2O. Well, there's no such thing. You can only explain why water exists or steam exists or ice exists or snow exists by talking of the relationships between aggregates of water. So you must think at a, 
a collective level, you can't analyse the economy by working up from the Swabian housewife. Now, that's the mistake that the mainstream of economics is making. So it's no wonder the public is confused. Again, like imagine yourself back 500 years ago, 600 years ago before Copernicus. An educated person knew the Earth was the centre of the universe and knew that the stars and the moons orbit around. Only idiots thought that the, the Earth was, the, the Sun was the centre. The idiots were right. So we have, with the Swabian Hausfrau and mainstream economics as well, we have a, an Earth-centric view of the solar system applied to economics. It can look empirically convincing and it's completely wrong. So we need a new economics based on rea real realism, reality, not ideology. And in a fundamental way, ideology is buried in mainstream economics, even though they're not aware of it. The trouble is, they dominate the university sector. They dominate government bodies. They dominate who gets funding to do research. And because they are isolated by being in a university system from the consequences of making huge mistakes, the universities are not where new ideas are coming out of. In fact, they are coming out of things like central banks. The Bank of England, as I've mentioned already, the Bundesbank has also come out and said that the heretics like myself are right about the role of money and the mainstream textbooks are wrong. There's innovation even taking place in the World Bank. So strangely enough, it's the institutional agencies which are more likely to innovate. So don't be so hard on the World Bank in future. Give them a hard time a bit, but they're getting better. But also support student groups who are protesting about this. There's a whole range of groups around Europe called Rethinking Economics. There must be at least 40 or 50 of those groups. They, need, they deserve support, they deserve to be listened to. And there are modern monetary reform groups as well, like Positive Money, the Modern Monetary Theory group as well. They tend to be at each other all the time, but they're equally bringing in a non-orthodox approach to economics, support what the new, uh, uh, brave new Europe is talking about, and maybe support me as well. Thank you.